Um, today we're going on our study of Revelation. Hasn't this been fun? Man alive, the seven churches were totally awesome. Uh, as we begin to see Jesus feeling about the church today, because all those seven churches are still around today, every one of them. And uh, then we got last week into the throne room of God. Well, the week before we were in the throne room as well, two weeks, one Revelation 4, one Revelation 5. Revelation 4, we saw that Jesus is the lion and the lamb. And then last week, wow, we saw the scroll being given to Jesus. What happened to creation the moment Jesus took the scroll? What happened? All creation began to worship. Fish, I didn't know fish knew how to worship. Birds know how to worship. That's what it says. All the living creatures on the earth began to worship. Come on. So maybe better than us. <laughs> they know how to worship because they've got a pure heart, right? And, and so I tell you, all creation begins to celebrate that something happened in the throne room. A legal transaction took place, we found last week, where Jesus took the scroll, which was the scroll of redemption, the scroll of redemption of the earth. How many know the earth is going to be totally redeemed? Because of the blood of Jesus. Is the blood of Jesus powerful? I'm telling you, the blood of Christ has the power to redeem everything in the universe. So he is awesome. So today we're going to open the chapter of 6 of Revelation. Go there if you will. Take your Bibles. If you have it online, open your phone up. Any more? There are more people online than I carry a Bible. I still like my Bible. I still like my Bible. All right. Whoa. I love it. Revelation chapter 6. As we continue on, let's read. Now when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals. Now he takes the scroll which has the seven seals. Now what we know what an ancient scroll was. It, it, the debt was on the inside of the scroll and the payment was on the outside. The terms of payment. So Jesus has that right. He has that right to open the scroll. So he takes the scroll and he, he, he breaks one of the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. Get ready to watch the beginning stages of the redemption of the earth. The seals are the first six things Jesus allows to happen on this earth. Now, let's go back a little bit and review. Say, Revelation is the love letter of Jesus to the church. Say it with me. The Revelation is the love letter of Jesus to the church. It's his love letter. Uh, this is a revelation of Jesus' end time action plan. Now, what's the name of our ministry, Carol? Action evangelism. So we're part of this. By the way, we had a great outreach Saturday. We had like over 20 people saved over there in the, in the parking lot. A lot of people came to get food and clothing. And it was great. We had a great outreach. And then I was with Tom and his church on Sunday morning. And man, the power of God just came down. And they opened a campus there. So he's going to help sponsor some of the men in the men's home. Uh, we're going to give a partial scholarship. And he's going to put in the balance and we're going to see men sign up now over there because he said Jerry we are not getting discipled he says we need Kingdom Life University to disciple our men Amen. and I said man you will get discipled you'll get in the word and I said they will be powerful men of God you watch what happens and there's some wonderful guys over there I really enjoyed meeting them and some new folks he has like 200 men in his men's home can you believe and we helped him start that six years ago when we did the first outreach on his church street, uh, church steps. We did a homeless outreach for his community and it inspired Tom. And then we ended up going downtown. He said, why don't we start a church down on Fortune and uh, Tampa streets, which we were down there for two years till the city removed us. And we fed every Saturday morning. You used to come down there with us, Socrates. We saw miracles and signs and wonders. And he began to take men off the street now, I heard President Trump yesterday announce that we're going to do something about the homeless. And about, thank you, God. Yes. Finally, something is being done about the homeless camps in America. 
I'm going to call his office and tell him, listen, we have a lot of experience with that in San Francisco. And you suggested maybe we ought to do the ship thing again. Every, every city that is, has a lot of homeless is a, is a, a seashore si a city, right? Yeah, port city. They're all port cities. There are enough ships on Mere Island to, to multiply what we did. We, we could house the homeless on ships. Wouldn't that be fun? It worked for us. Now, not everybody did good on the ship. Some lasted about two hours because one fellow said, I know what you're going to do. You're going to haul us out to sea. Nah, you know, people are a little spooked sometimes. But anyway, it worked. And, and the ship we had for the homeless in San Francisco housed 619 men. That's a lot of homeless. One city alone has 1,000 people in their camp. One ship would take care of that camp in one city. Is, is that amazing? So there are solutions. I don't know how President Trump's planning on doing it, but he said if he gets in office, he's going to take care of the homeless. You know, that's practical. The church is, church is going to have to get involved. If this is going to work, no social program will transform the homeless into productive citizens. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that transforms from the inside out. That's the solution. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a solution. So pray. I don't know if we're going to have any contact with him on that. Now, this first rider of the horse says, come and see what's about to happen. And it was a white horse. So put up the white horse if you would there. All right. This is, let's look at this white horse. Now, these are called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I got 160,000 views on this video that I shot years ago over up there on 54. Uh, a lot of people like this theme, <laughs> the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first is a white horse. Now, what does the white horse represent? Who's going to come back from heaven on a white horse? Jesus. All right. By the way, this is not Jesus. This first horse is not Jesus. Uh, I could give a lot of reasons behind it. We don't have time to go into them all. But what this is, is the Antichrist. Satan comes as a angel of light. What was his purpose in heaven when he exalted himself against God? He wanted to be what? Like God. In fact, he said, I want my throne to be above God's throne. Wow. So God threw him out of heaven. So this Antichrist is going to come with a bow but no arrows. Which means he's going to conquer the world peacefully. He's going to take the world by a peace agreement. It's going to be a time of a lot of turmoil on the earth. Is that happening today? What if somebody came along with a peace agreement that settled everything on the world and, and brought worldwide peace? Would he, would he be honored today by the world? Would he be lifted up? So he's going to conquer the world peacefully, and he has been, he's being given a crown, which means he's given authority by the nations. So this first is the Antichrist, because it begins a series of things that happened on the earth. Now, I, I particularly feel, when I, when I was over in uh, Israel, I went through the Israel Institute of Tourism in the museum. And the uh, Israeli Institute of Tourism had all the articles of the temple in it. And I, it was supernatural how we got in there because uh, remember Bob used to come to the class here years ago, Bob uh, Burroughs, and, and uh, uh, somehow we went late. We missed the last tour of the day. But as we were kind of bemoaning the fact and walking out of the institute, a, a Jewish high priest was there. He, he was walking in and he said, did you guys miss the tour? We said, yeah. He said, I'll personally take you through. So the two of us went through a personal tour of the institute. And if you went through the regular tour, you weren't able to shoot any video. But because we had a private tour, he said, yeah, I'll go ahead and shoot. So I got video of all the articles of the temple, except the ark, which they, they say they know where it's at. Now, why are you mentioning this? Because the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation is going to cause what's called the abomination of desolation. And I asked the high priest that took us through the tour, I said, would you tell me 
How long would it take if the temple was rebuilt to put all the articles that you have here in the institute into the temple and be fully functioning? He said 30 days. He said if the temple is rebuilt, he said in 30 days we could take all the, the articles of the temple into it and open up the temple again, the restored temple. I believe that's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to be built. Some say it's on David's uh, ancient location. Some say that the Muslims are going to get, give room next to the mosque there. I don't know where it's going to be built, but it's going to be built. And there's a lot of talk about it. They've already begun pr uh, producing sacrifices. They, moved, they, they actually surveyed the Temple Mount and found out where they think the ancient uh, sacrifices were given. And uh, I got pictures of them because they didn't even wear shoes on the Temple Mount. They said it was such hollowed ground. And so they think they found the place. So they put this portable uh, um, sacrificial altar out there and they actually offer lambs. They're, they're offering lambs on, the, on this uh, uh, altar. So things are getting in preparation. How many know it's a time of preparation for the coming of the Lord? So here we have the first horse rider is a white horse. Now we, and when I opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, come and see. Now these four living creatures we talked about last week that were around the throne that cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty who was and is and is to come night and day. They've been doing it 24 hours a day ever since they were created, if they were created, I believe they were, of course, created at the throne. And, and these four creatures release these four horsemen on the earth. I told you last week that those four creatures had to do with earth. They had to do with what's happening on earth. Ezekiel saw them, Isaiah saw them. So the four, four creatures. creatures. Uh, what, what, what is earth referred to? The four corners, remember, of the earth? Uh, the four angels at Euphrates are going to be released in one of the judgments. So the earth has to do with number four. And so the second seal, the second rider, uh, peace now is almost immediately broken. After this world leader comes and guarantees peace all over the world, the second horse rider is what? The red horse. And red is what? It's war, destruction. The red horse comes. And what is the red horse? What's the characteristics? It's a warning. It's a warning. We see that, that the peace is broken, the peace agreement. What does is, what is 1 Thessalonians say? When men say there is peace and safety on the earth, be, beware, be careful. That's the warning God gives us. What does it say? I think I put it in here. Look at it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, and 4. When they say peace and safety, then what? Sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not what? In darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. We're not in darkness. We're not going to be surprised when this happens. Let's take another step back into Revelation 5, because what's happening? The church is praying. The prayers of the saints release the seals. Did you get that? Yeah. The prayers of the saints release the seals. It's, it's back at, you know, in, in chapter 5. I don't know if I want to look it up real quick, but it says that the 24 elders are gathering the prayers of the saints, and the 24 elders take those prayers, put them on the altar, and then an angel takes the fire off the altar and releases the seals. So we have the second creature saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to, uh, to the one who sat to take peace off the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there, there was given to him a great sword. Now this great sword in, in the Greek here, Socrates can verify this, indicates a major, major battle worldwide. Could be this, the nations of the north that come down. Ezekiel 38. Is China and Russia preparing? Yes. Do you hear about that today? Along with North Korea? Yes. Are they making preparations? Oh, yeah. 
We've never seen such a time where uh, this is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Peace is taken off the earth and a great sword is given to the second rider, which means it extends worldwide. Oh, I know this is such a cheery chapter this morning. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Now, uh, what, what am I saying about the Revelation being a love letter? See, chapter 1 is Jesus' love for, uh, for, for the world. In fact, the first thing mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, him who what? Loved us and gave himself for us. You know Revelation starts out with love. Do you know the seven churches talk about love? You have lost your what? First love. Do you know that the throne room is the place of all love? When John went into heaven and saw what he saw, he saw the love of God. Anybody that's been in heaven comes back with one testimony. What is it, Socrates? The love, of God. love of God overwhelms and it's like liquid love. People that even, I just listened to another NDE the other day, and those are near-death experiences, and this guy was so skeptical. He was raised in real, young guy was raised in real religious. Uh, I won't give the name of the, the religion that he was in, but he was so, he couldn't do anything. It was all so legalistic, and he would judge people, and he, when he spoke, you know, he'd go to the streets and preach against everything. And God took him to heaven, and God said, I'm not even going to judge you the way you've judged others. He said, let me tell you how I see you. And he showed him pure love and he came back totally changed. He said, I, I can no longer judge people. I thought, powerful. The love of God. So it's love. But what Revelation 6 through 19 is, is the cleansing power of love of the earth. It's how Jesus is going to cleanse this earth of all evil. And this is the beginning of it. The manifestation of the Antichrist. War breaks out in the second, second rider. And the peace is taken off the earth. And a great sword given. And then the third angel. And when he opened the third seal, verse 5, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and beheld a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. Wow. And I heard a voice in the midst of the midst of 11 creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and a quart of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Wow, we have some awesome things in these verses. This is a time of sword, famine, death, and beasts. Is, it, is this the... The black horse, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a black horse, okay. And uh, that's the third, right? Yeah, the black horse is the third. So this is a time of, of lack on the earth. It's marked by shortages, a scale in his hand. How many know you need to get ready for things? Now, we have uh, four bedrooms in our house, and in one of our bedrooms, Mariana has filled it. Not the whole bedroom, the closet. I think she has 10 bags of rice in there and 10 bags of beans in there. And she's got a cooker that you can put out on our patio and actually cook beans and rice. She's prepared. And I've got a generator in the garage, a little thousand watt generator we used to use on the streets for outreach, if you remember. So we can generate, set, generate our house if we need to. We need to be prepared. I don't, I'm not an ultra pepper, pre prepper, what do we call it? Ultra pepper, yeah, ultra pepper. Uh, but I do believe in getting ready for things. And my kids do too. They've kind of talked her into all this. So she just kept buying different rices and different beans and kind of learning. You know, when I was in Haiti, that's all we ate. And if you cook rice and beans right, they're good. Maybe throw in a little something along with them, a little spices and maybe meat. You can live on that. So uh, we're, we're kind of halfway prepared. You know the story of the two doves while we moved out of Westwood Lakes and moved up north? And I don't understand all this. God knows. I do know this, that if God sent two angels to warn Lot in wicked Sodom, 
Don't you think he's going to send angels to your door? See, that day is not going to overtake us as a thief. We're not the children of darkness. We're children of light. That's why we're not to be obsessed with this. Do what you can to prepare. Get ready. Even if it's not the tribulation, in case we lose major power, the power grid could go down. What would happen if the power grid went down? Gas stations would all close. Grocery stores would all close. You're on your own. I think Marianna bought this filter thing too. We can go to the lakes right next to our house and take the water on the lakes and put it through this filter and drink it. Simple stuff, and this is not expensive. A bag of rice is what, $15? <laughs> she gets these like 50 pound bags. So get ready, just do some things to prepare in case something happens. And we're overlooking at carpet because we have home church at our house and the carpet's really worn in my, my uh, office and we, everybody has to go through the office to use the restroom and we have home church and so Marianna says, we've got to replace that carpet. So she's out doing Uber Eats and everything to get money and she's earned enough now to redo the carpet. And so we went over looking at carpet and I'm sitting there at Home Depot and looking at this guy, I know this guy. And he looks up and he says, you're Jerry Brandt, right? I said, you're Ken Black, aren't you? <laughs> Remember Ken Black? How many of us went over to his house and looked at his Moringa stuff? How many were there? I went over with Gordon and our team from, how many went, anybody here? Were you? Yeah, but Ken Black has proof of concept of how to grow Moringa in Florida. He's researched now for 10 years and used the University of Su uh, Southern Florida, USF, laboratory to prove the concept that Moringa can grow in Florida. Is that exciting? You grow it. And, you know, I don't know. I keep feeling this in my spirit. I could be off the wall. And if I am, just write me off on this. But I believe somehow Florida is going to be a major supplier for our whole nation in this time of shortage. All the citrus property, 100,000 acres between here and Miami, that could all be planted in Moringa and, and organic stuff that goes along with the Moringa. There's a lot of organic plants that, that can't. And you know what would be good? Take these homeless and begin to build places out on these uh, kingdom uh, kingdom communities, put them out there in homes and put them to work on the farms. Would that work? The homeless? Wouldn't that solve the homeless? <laughs> and I mean, I was raised on a farm where we had workers, migrant workers come up every summer and work our sugar beets. We had three families. We had three little places on our ranch, little huts. They weren't real fancy, but these families would stay in these huts only three months out of the year and they would work our sugar beet crop and uh, it was all hand, it was all hand worked. You had to thin the sugar beets with, with a hoe and that was bending over and walking. I mean, a lot of us aren't geared for that, but these migrant workers, they, they enjoyed it. And they earned enough money in three months working on our farm that they ne didn't have to work all year in Mexico. The rest of the year, they, they could rest on just the money they made with us. So I understand this thing of migrant workers and how, taking people, putting them on the farm, putting them to work. And you know what? The farm's a healthy atmosphere. Hello? Hello. Farm's a healthy atmosphere. Yes. I think one of the reasons I'm healthy, I, this is my theory, don't write this down as fact, because I can't prove it. I had my hands in the soil until I was 18 years old. And I think the minerals of the soil got under my fingernails and strengthen my bones and my body. And I, I was, I've been healthy most, most of my life since I'm 18, strong. I think somehow ra being raised on the farm is healthy. Keeping your finger in the soil is healthy. That's what God made us for, isn't it? I'm sorry? Oh, bare feet, yeah. I, I was on the beach Tuesday morning and I walk. I go down and I sit at my little umbrella in my chair and I walk the beach and sit there and do a lot of my email stuff. Because you, you ground yourself, see? 
There are ways to stay healthy. Is that, is it, am I right on this? Would it be fun to put community, kingdom communities all the way up here to Miami and let the government help us do it and say, Trump, this is going to solve your homeless problem in Florida and your migrant problem? All these migrants that have come in, they're good workers. They're hard workers. They did things on the farm that even my brother and I didn't want to do. They're geared for this stuff. So there are solutions, I don't know, but there are going to be shortages. I guarantee you there's going to be famines or already are around the world. And this, this third, this black horse, says there are scales in the hand. So it's going to, and, and do you know you're going to work a whole day for a loaf of bread? It's going to take a whole day's labor to buy one loaf of bread in this time. That's famine. And we in America just drop by the grocery store on the way home and get whatever we want and it's always more than enough and you go down the shelf and nothing's lacking and, you know, we, we're, we're spoiled. But this may not be true all the time. So we, this black horse is a horse of famine and what happens in famine? Death happens. And beasts begin to take over. Now these are not lions and dogs and things like that. These are rats. These are small rodents. Do you know that rats cost over a billion dollars a year just managing them through restaurants across America? I read that on the, on the internet. Over a billion dollars a year is spent to control rats. They carry 30 diseases. And so uh, these, are, these are just, this is the four, third, third uh, uh, rider. Now let's go to the fourth. And I heard the fourth seal be opened, and I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on him was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given him over a fourth of the earth. Now what's going to happen? Following this third horse of famine and death and lack and shortage and, and uh, that's talked about in the third seal, one-fourth of mankind is going to die in this fourth judgment. That's what it says. A fourth of the earth is going to, be, is going to die in death. How many is that? Two billion? You know, we, we look at COVID. Now, look what COVID did. By the way, death, uh, I, may, I forgot to mention that. Death in the third writer, death is called viral diseases. It's a specific word for death in the Greek. Viruses are going to be loosed on the earth. You know, we're, we're getting immune to a lot of things because we've taken so many antibiotics and if you don't take them, you eat the meat of animals that take them. So you're taking antibiotics just by eating the meat of the animals. Chickens, they're able to increase the size of chickens with antibiotics and I, I know on the farm they raise cattle with antibiotics now. So we're becoming immune to a lot of these things. How difficult was it for them to overcome COVID with a vaccination? And we, some of us question that. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, these famines, this called death, which is viral diseases, could take a lot of people. What, 50 million people died in the bubonic plague? That's a lot of people in England, I mean in Europe. And we opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell on this earth? So the fifth seal are martyrs. The martyrs. Now, I don't know how it's going to happen in the tribulation. There's going to be a lot of people give their lives. I particularly think martyrdom is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at Stephen. When he's being stoned, his face glowed. In fact, I think his testimony helped convert Paul. As Paul held the robe of Stephen as they were stoning him. And so uh, I think martyrdom is going to increase on the earth in the time of tribulation. But I believe God's going to give grace to those that die for their faith. They die victorious. 
In fact, they're given white robes in heaven. <laughs> they're made pillars in the church. We learned about the seven churches. God has a specific honor for those that give their life for the sake of the gospel. I know when uh, uh, just a few weeks ago we went up to Ocala and saw Nate Saint's, Saint's son, Stephen Saint. Nate was one of the five missionaries that were speared down in the Yaka Indians, if you remember that, years ago. And by the way, that caused more people to go into the mission field almost. That was like a blood seed that was sown on the earth that m m mobilized many, many hundreds, if not thousands of missionaries around the world. People saw what happened and uh, martyrdom somehow has an ability to multiply the harvest. I don't understand all that, but we find it in the early church. And it wasn't easy in the book of Acts. Look what happened. They, they were up against it. We've had it so easy here in America. But we may have some pretty tough days ahead. And are we ready for it? Are we prepared? So the martyrdom is, is the fifth seal. So I said, I saw under the altar the souls that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. And they cried, how long, how long? And then their completion, their cry, their completion, the white robes were given to each one of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed were, as it were, completed. I don't understand that. I'll be very honest with you. I've thought this verse out. I don't understand what it means that the number of completion on the earth before it's finished. But evidently God in his sovereignty knows exactly the number of martyrs that are going to be taken off this earth. And they're given honor in heaven, white robes, pillars in the temple of God. In fact, turn to Psalm 94. Uh, Psalm 94, I, I was reading that this morning. Uh, that's uh, because it's the prayers of the saints the cry of the saints that really stopped this. Uh, go to Psalm 94. This is a psalm, I call it imprecatory prayer. Let's look at it. Lord, O Lord, vengeance belongs to you, O God, and to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up, O judges of the earth. Render punishments to those that are proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? They utter speech and speech on insolent things and the, the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord. So that whole chapter talks about God bringing the vengeance. God brings the vengeance. We don't need to do, do that. Vengeance is the Lord's. You know, over my ministry life, I've, I've, I've observed so many times that where things could have happened to me by people that Kind of came against us different times. I was talking to Tom yesterday, Tom Atkinson. I don't think he minds me sharing this because it was very public. Tampa Tribune came against his men's home. Yeah. They tried to take it down. Yes. They, they appointed three investigators to spend three months to find something wrong with his men's home. Yeah. I mean, he was really under attack. They shut off the financing for his veterans that were in his home that paid for all of his bills for the men's home. He said, Jerry, we were this close to going under. And he said, then God sent along a lady from Channel 8. Amen. She's sitting in my office. And she happened to be a, a, a graduate of Southeastern University, the Assembly of God School down the road. And Tom just told her, he said, you know what? He said, we are getting ready to get shut down. She says, I don't understand this. She said, have they found anything wrong? He says, they have not found one thing wrong with our men's home. They've accused us of a lot of things. What happened is a couple of the men that felt like they were abused hello, in the home went, went to the social services and, and said, we're going to report you and shut down your men's home. How many know when you do the work of the Lord, you have to, sometimes it's a battle. The enemy doesn't like what you're doing. He doesn't like what Tom's doing and setting all those men free down there. I mean, it is happening. I saw it this weekend. Church was full Sunday morning, and most of them were out, men out of his men's home. And these guys are victorious, and they're, they're growing in the Lord. And pray that a lot of them sign up for a university. Everyone, he invited them to write a letter, and if they write a letter, he's going to enroll them in our, our class down there. 
and we're going to supplement. It's, you know, they're not able to pay a lot, but they're going to help. So it's going to work. It's going to work. But I tell you what, he was under a tremendous attack. And, and he prayed that morning. He said, Lord, if you don't do something, we're done. So while this reporter from Channel 8 is sitting in his office, the call came in from the social services, and he says, I never hit my speakerphone, but something told me to hit my speaker. And now the call is live in his office with this reporter there. And it's the, it's the government that says, we are shutting you down. We'll give you 30 days. And this little reporter from Channel 8 started to cry. She says, why are they shutting you down when you've done nothing wrong? He said, it's just an attack of the enemy. Well, she was a Christian, of course, from Southeastern. She says, I'm going to give a report by the end of this week that's going to change everything. He said the chances of her being in his office when that call came in, and he had just sat behind the desk and told her exactly what could happen. And the next few minutes, the call came in, he hit the speakerphone, and she heard it herself, and she says, we can't let this happen. And God turned everything around, everything around. And Tom has an attorney that works with him that he led his son out of deep, deep drugs. And he's a very leading attorney here. I won't mention his name here in the city of Tampa. But this attorney carries a lot of weight with high-level people. He said, Tom, I guarantee you we could sue Tampa Tribune and get $8 million. He said, I put the numbers on it. He says, they are liable, liable for all they've done to you. He says, I know your I know your man, so I'm on your board. I know what's going on. He said, Tom said, wait a minute. He said, what, the, what are the consequences? He said, you'll be in court for the next 10 years. Tom says, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to put it in the hands of the Lord. What does it say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't have to defend yourself. I've had things happen over the years, that false accusations, things. God always, always vindicated me. I never went to battle for myself. I just like the Lord. Okay, Lord, here, it's yours. If you want this to go on and do what we're supposed to do, you'll take care of it. And uh, look at verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand for me against the workers of iniquity of, of Psalms 94? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would have settled in silence. I would have gone down. If my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. Aren't you glad that God surrounds us with his grace, protection? Yes. Yes. So I'm not worried. I'm not worried about being a martyr or whatever. If that time came where we have to die for our faith, I've got a video that uh, is on my YouTube channel that Jim Carzabel put on. He was speaking at a Catholic university. And he spoke on the topic. You may want to go, go on my YouTube channel and check this out. He spoke on the topic, are you ready to die for your faith? He said, when I shot the Passion movie, he said, Mel Gibson came to me when I was on the cross. A doctor was there on the set. He said, the purple on my body was not makeup. He said, that's the color that my body turned when I was on the cross making that movie. And Mel Gibson asked him, Jim, we can take you down right now and stop this. He said, I've already given my life up. Wow. He said, if I die making this movie, I hope many will come to Christ. That's what he said. It's, you can hear his interview right on my channel. Got, what, 1.3 million hits on that interview on my channel. It's awesome. And I got 32,000 responses on that video. Can you believe? People are listening to that. Just yesterday, I mean, over this Easter holiday, everything really goes up. But Jim, Jim said, I already died. He said, death to me means nothing. But I thought his, his, his talk was really interesting. He's a sharp guy, very intelligent. But he said, if we're not ready to die for our faith in America, we're not really prepared emotionally and spiritually. And I thought, ah, that's powerful. But vengeance is the Lord. So martyrdom is going to be common during the tribulation. And finally... Oh my, this is such a cheery chapter. Let's go back there. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. 
What's the last? What's the sixth seal? Well, it's not the last. The seventh seal, by the way, opens up the, tr the trumpets. The seventh seal unlooses the trumpets. But the sixth seal, let's see what it is here, okay? Uh, and now look and open the sixth seal, verse 12. And behold, there, were great er there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth and, uh, of, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and a fig tree, as a fig tree uh, drops its late figs, shaken by the mighty wind, and the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, and the mighty men, and every slave, and every free man, hid themselves in the caves, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It's interesting that the world who's, they say there are a lot of atheists out there, but at this time, it seems like everybody is no longer an atheist. They realize what's happening is happening because God's on the throne. They acknowledge that God is in control. But they cry the rocks to fall on them. Can you imagine what happens in an earthquake? Volcanoes. When that earthquake hit Ireland recently, remember the jets couldn't fly over there for a number of months because the... the, the uh, ash would get in the jet engines and, and stop them. And the sky turned red. What happens when the ash of volcanoes happens? Earthquake. Well, uh, earthquakes. Can you imagine an earthquake that's worldwide? So what's going to happen. Islands are going to move. Mountains are going to fall. Wow. It's a tremendous time. As you can see, things are getting ready to happen on the earth. <laughs> it's kind of a heavy duty time, isn't it? A, a lot of re revelation, we're gonna just go through it and see what God's saying and get ready and prepare ourselves. I missed one thing in one of the, and with this I wanna close. The only thing Satan can't touch is the oil and the wine. That's what it says. Touch not the oil and the wine. He has authority over everything but the oil and the wine. What's that? What's the wine? The blood and communion. The, the wine is the covenant of communion over the blood of Christ. What's the oil? Holy Spirit anointing. So those that walk in God's anointing and walk under the covenant of communion are going to be protected. Say, I'm going to be protected. God's my covering. I have the blood of Jesus. I plead it all the time. We did earlier this morning here over this room. Some of us prayed. We just plead the blood of Christ and cover us, Lord. Take care of us. Satan cannot touch the oil and the wine. So I, I tell you, I feel, I feel at peace. Let the peace of God rule in your heart to the which you're called in one body and be thankful. So when I read all these things in Revelation... They could upset me. But can you imagine it says the commanders and the heads and the kings and the mighty men and the slaves and every free man hid themselves. There's going to be a time on this earth where men are not going to find any comfort. I call it there two prayers. Uh, hit, the last one of this, hit the last one. The tribulation saints pray in peace. The tribulation sinners are in pain. <laughs> They're going to realize that they're, they're, if they don't find God, they're, they're going to be without hope. Now, these six seals, what I'm excited about here, these six seals prepare chapter 7. And what is chapter 7? No. Chapter 7 is the greatest revival in the history of mankind that hits earth. We'll see it next week. It's a parenthesis between the seals and the trumpets. You're right, chapter 8 starts the trumpets. There is, it's a world revival. In fact, it's the fulfillment of action evangelism. Not that God's waiting on the throne for our fulfillment. He's going to do it his way. But it's been our dream that every person in every tribe and tongue and dialect hears the message. 
And in chapter 7 of Revelation, guess what? John gets the vision of the end time harvest completed. We're going to look at that next week. How he sees around the throne people, watch this, from every tribe, tongue, and dialect around the throne. So say, this harvest is going to be completed. It may take some tribulation. When things start happening on this earth and the comfort zone of the rich people, it says the rich, it mentions the rich along with the kings and the mighty men. They're going to flee to the mountains.